right, we're back for episode three. This is the Starship Rift Arcade Podcast. And with me, the illustrious, the magical beast that is... Mike Murray. <laughs> Mike Murray. Mike Murray, the owner of the Geek Pub and the Time Rift Arcade, coming to you soon in a soon. galaxy near you. And to my right is Roman this Saldivar. Fancy guy. This is Roman Saldivar. What do you do, Roman? I, I, I dabble. I'm a dabbler. He's a dabbler, folks. So <laughs> if you need your dabbles dabbled, he'll do it for you. <laughs> All right. Oh so we're on episode three. And today, if you've read the title of the podcast, podcast here today we're going to be talking about games that changed the game uh is what we're talking about so these are very influential uh game changing arcade machines uh and games that just did something different or it set a uh, trajectory for the arcade if you will so uh, it may have invented a whole genre it may have just changed the way controls work uh it could be a sound thing pretty much anything these guys want to talk about because again <laughs> we're loose with the rules here so uh, but before we start that i do want to do our just kind of a first segment here and that's the news in the arcade industry or what we're up to so is there anything that you've been doing uh at uh Casa de la Saldivar. <laughs> well, um, right now I'm working on a couple things. Um, I've been working with my Blast City and my, uh, my new net city, and I want to change my new net city to JAMA. So right now, it actually just came in today. Got all the wiring, going to dual wire it. So I'm going to go ahead and wi wire in everything JAMA, get some stuff moved around. So Fantastic. He just wiring. got a loom in the mail is what just he told got me a earlier. Loom in the mail. So uh, th those are candy cabs. If you haven't looked those up, then look them up. There's some really, really cool things uh, coming over from Japan, and that's the candy cabs he's talking that's about there. Yep. So, and that's what he's into. If you didn't watch the previous two, you're going <laughs> to... Watch this one. I'm sure you'll figure it out. He'll, yep, uh, love he'll, the he'll mention guys. them. Uh, and Mr. Mike Murray, what have you been up to? Oh, man. I have spent the week off and on um, working on the most beautiful Atari Liberator cabinet. It was really nice. Um, got uh, got lucky with that one, but it's the side art's just gorgeous. Got a couple little chips. Um, I did a recap on the monitor. Man, it just looks it looks brand new. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about it. What's the name of it? Atari Liberator. So yeah, if you're not familiar with Atari Liberator, don't be surprised if you're not. It, uh, it it's kind of a spiritual sequel to Missile Command. Absolutely. And uh, it's but it's flipped upside down, right? So now instead of you know shooting at missiles that are coming to the ground, you're in space shooting missiles that are coming up into space. Oh, it's, nice. It's actually based. The idea came from um, uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, Star Wars defense system, right? And they yeah. kind of used that idea and made a game around it. It's uh, really neat. It's really really neat uh but anyway only 762 made and we have one that's right very nice great condition one too. so y'all be looking out for the other 761 of them we'll hit a whole <laughs> set so it should be easy to track uh, those down i wonder how many are actually uh, are still alive like I wonder still about around that. i wonder because i wonder if that got converted just thrown it away pushed in a dumpster firewood you know. yep never know CRT went out. No one wanted to find a new CRT one. CRT went out. <laughs> this one has a nice CRT. You did something with it. This. Yeah, just put a cap kit in it and uh, did just kind of refloat all the... Uh, it had a problem. The main problem is a little washed out. Mm -hmm. um, I think the cap kit fixed that. And then it had the blue was flickering. And I think that was just a cold solder joint on the blue transistor. But it's gorgeous now. So all of you new subscribers on the Time Rift Arcade channel on YouTube, uh, you've posted a video. Mm -hmm. I got a video on, on the Time Rift channel. Yep. Fantastic. Well, those wonderful guys. I worked on Contra today. We had a Contra that we purchased at auction probably two auctions ago. It had um, a flat screen monitor in it, and I don't like flat screen <laughs> monitors. So I They're put a so CRT amazing. back in it. So uh, <laughs> Mike uh, 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 purposefully tries to convert everything to, to LCD. I, pro I promise you <laughs> earlier, it looked a little more daunting because it had been flipped to a flat screen, you know? And I went, oh, Mike doesn't really mind if a flat screen, so maybe this goes to the top. Ah! <laughs> and I was like, I kind of still want to put a CRT in it. So that's I was like, not what I said. I know. I'm just telling you who I thought. So like, that's why I was like, he'll probably take this one if I just, oh, and I was like, no, I, 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 better, I better go ahead and convert it. So um, anyway. I'm glad you did. Yeah, everybody yeah, would be yeah, glad. Yeah, I think everybody would be glad I put it back to CRT. And yeah. thanks to Roman for driving to oh, yeah. Tim Buck too. Oh, to, yeah, no, uh, no buy, problem to get a monitor for hey, it. I was so, on my way over there anyway. He was already going. Yeah, he was so. already going, folks. So why not? Uh, anything new in the industry? Anything you need to touch on for Time Rift? I don't think so. Okay. Well, let's get to it. So we're talking again about influential game-changing games, right? So 
I will start uh, if, if you're okay with that. So I think we got to go back and again, just reset to where, what games we're talking about here. We're talking about video games that are commercial games that have a, uh, that accept a coin. So the first one I would say is pretty influential is computer space in 1971. Have you seen this cabinet? I have never, I've seen just like videos of it mm -hmm. on, you know, like YouTube and stuff, you know, people playing with it, but I've never seen one in person. Oh, ever. gotcha. Gotcha. How about you? Have you seen computer space? I have not. All right. So if you go to the video game museum in Frisco, they actually have one of those and, and maybe a couple of other options. It's a big fiberglass cabinet. They came in multiple different colors. Uh, the yellow one really sticks out in my mind because that's one that was in the advertisement with like a lady in an evening gown standing us <laughs> to it. Video game advertisements for the, uh, from the 70s are amazing. In early 80s, for that matter, are really amazing. But uh, yeah, it's uh, just a black and white computer game. And it was the... Commercially operated, this is a Nolan Bushnell thing. We talked about him being the creator of Atari and Chuck E. Cheese and involved with Pong and this computer space here. So that would be my, I would say that kind of set the, okay, we can stick a coin in it. That's pretty so, influential. All right, so I have a question. So how come, like if you just Google the topic of this podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody always puts Pong at number one. Yeah, I think so because, and I can tell you why, because I have that on the list as number two. It came out in 1972, a year later, and it was the first commercially successful game. Ah, okay. So the first game, it, the first commercial game, but not necessarily successful. Pong is really, in my eyes, more influential than computer space, but you know, you gotta mention computer space since it was number one. Yeah. I'll right. tell you another fun fact about Pong since you brought it up there. Um, this would also be considered the first sports game ever. Really? Because it's tennis. <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. There's a fun fact for you guys, and y'all can dispute that one in the comments if it's really a sports game, but the first commercially successful game was a I sports game. I mean, it's game. sort of like ping pong. It's competition. Yeah. It's at least ping pong, yeah. right? Because it's right. called pong. That is a sport. There you go. So, and, you know, it's... I mean, Forrest Gump played it. I mean, That's right. <laughs> I, it's got to be a sport. It's in the Olympics. There you I, go. And when is pong going to be in the Olympics is the question. So, anyway, that's my little two bits of some early ones. I got a whole bunch of fun facts, but uh, let's go, Mike. What do you think? What about, what's an influential one for you? Uh, well, I mean, I just recently made a video about it for the Time Rift also with Space Invaders. I Space mean, Invaders, came, absolutely. Came out, you know, not too much uh, past those. And I think for me, Space Invaders is, it's the first one that had sprites, right? Okay. So, you know, Pong, I guess some people might consider the little ball bouncing back and forth a sprite. Okay. But at least programmatically, it was not a sprite. <laughs> I got you. Okay. So Space Invaders had all these individual little sprite characters. And mm. it was the first one to have what I would call like animated graphics, you know, right? Like the, the, the characters actually move and do something. Um, whereas, again, with Pong, it's a static ball that's just moving around the screen. So to me, that's the one I think of. You know, one thing Space Invaders did that I didn't... I didn't see in any games before it, certainly, is it had that telescoping screen and the cardboard backdrop behind it. <laughs> that was kind of cool. Like, yes. when well, the first time I saw that, I was really pretty amazed because it looks like the graphics are floating in space. I've often wondered if there were designers, you know, we'll never know, but I wonder if there were designers sitting in a room going, okay, we're going to make this game, but we can't make these graphics. And somebody came up with the idea of, hey, we could put graphics behind the screen. Right. You know, and like it's that's pretty genius. Genius, absolutely. Yeah, they were working with what they had. They're working with what they had, yeah. yeah. And the whole, uh, what is it? So like, it's a, like a UV light that they put in there that makes yeah, it glow. I believe so. It's yeah. gorgeous. Oh, it's great. I think there's a white black light, maybe. Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, I used, it's, it's in both Space Invaders and Space Invaders Deluxe. I think the Deluxe may have like a color gel over it, maybe I the think difference. You're, yes. Yep. I think you're right. It does, yes. right? Okay. Good. I get, I get to be right once today. I always get that mixed <laughs> up because like, I worked on that moon base cocktail and it uh, has yeah. multiple gels mm -hmm. to make the whole screen. It, but it's a, still a black and white game. Absolutely. I know a game that's a little, I don't know if it's on there, but Warlords, uh, it has a, a gel on the, the upright actually with that weird backdrop, but it's a black and white monitor, I believe. And then on the cocktail table, it's a color monitor, which I, think I didn't know that. It's kind of neat. I didn't so. know that. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Kind of fun. What about you, my friend? So I guess I want to say first is that we did our list individually. So oh, yeah. we have to realize that this won't be in chronological order. Oh, and no, we also may be talking about stuff that's um, 
someone else has talked about. So I'm going to oh. throw that out there for the no, for, that's for totally our fine. viewing audience. Again, here. Gotcha. no rules, no rules, guys. Right. Get rid of it. You're free to. You're like if if yours. Was, I'm just making something up. But if yours was Space Invaders too, you're free to talk about it. Oh, I'm going to. Don't okay. worry. <laughs> Get you some Space Invaders. So uh, I'm going to continue the Space Invaders and yeah. um, and and just tell a little bit why I think it was such a great game changer as well. It wasn't just about the sprites. Um, but when it came out, uh, it was so good, so popular. And we've touched base on this and mm-hmm. on another podcast, but there are actually entire arcades dedicated to just oh, this game absolutely. where you yeah, walked yeah. in and there was 50 arcades, but it was all Space Invaders. So I'm sitting here, I mean, I'm so glad you said that yeah. because I'm sitting here thinking about this purely from a, a technical perspective, but right. you're talking about a cultural perspective. Yeah, this, is, this, this <laughs> changed the culture. And, you know, thinking about it beer terms, I think this is probably the one game that, that started the revolution of video games because they know how profitable could be, profitable it could be, and to put it into perspective, not not uh, adjusted for uh, inflation. In four years, that game made three point eight billion dollars. So I don't know if you know this, but there's still a Space Invaders in Japan. There's still a Space Invaders annual competition. Oh, I didn't know that. I, I actually I have a video. I have a picture. I'll throw in the video. That's awesome. But it's they get together and they line up all these cocktail tables and they play Space Invaders in a competition. That's awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and, hey, to you know, this day. and that's that game that stands the test of time. And I think we talked about it on our previous podcast where we said, "What games do you need to have in your arcade?" Space Invaders, Space Invaders games. is one for sure. You know, yeah. there's you're, you're going to be able to find one when you're looking for one, <laughs> but getting one in good condition, putting it together, you, you want to have a nice one if you have one of those. You can get a nice one of those. Absolutely. So, but that that one I think started the revolution of hey, we can make money off of this. So let's put the effort into making these great games to make more money. I got you. So uh, I'll just. We'll close the. Or do we have anything else about Space Invaders? No. I don't want. I'll close. Go the, play it. I'll clo- <laughs> yeah, go play Space <laughs> go Invaders. Play space, uh, yeah. So, uh, just to close up on that, it was the first game to retain high scores between sessions. Ew. I didn't know Fair that. You know, it, 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 now it resets when it has a loss of power at the end of the night. Um, the to go back just a hair back on that. There's a. Um, Is there a uh, high score saves for that game? N- there may be. I don't know. I don't know either. That's a good question. Somebody comment below. Yeah, is there a high score saves kit for Space Invaders? I think there is. I know there's a multi game kit. I mean, it, Galen, <laughs> I've fixed Galen <laughs> Space Invaders. Tell me if I put a high score save kit in it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Seawolf actually precedes it, the first to keep a high score. Like, but it wasn't, they didn't have it thought out yet. So, Seawolf, you could just do your personal best, but you could hit a button and reset it. It was almost like oh. resetting a. Right. Uh, you know, like a, you're a, a, a meter, a, your right. speedometer or your trip meter on your <laughs> exactly. car. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> it's your trip meter. So you could reset your high score with a button. Right. So it didn't actually retain a high score to compete with others. It was just your own personal to like reset. So right. kind of weird. But uh, that was uh, two years before that. And uh, yeah. Oh, uh, Space Invaders. Also, continuous background music. First one. Very interesting. Do you consider it music? I, he's con- I, not me. I didn't write. Mr. Google wrote this. I didn't write this. <laughs> <laughs> so because it's, I mean, it's I like, guess it's. And, I always thought uh, think of that as uh, the moving uh, of the. It, me too. But I guess it. It is continuous. I guess it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, that, that's credited that. So again, if I'm wrong, I apologize. These are just wow. the fun, weird facts that I found out about I'm, these. I'm actually intrigued. Now, yeah, now, yeah. Now I want to see if there's a soundtrack for it. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, two the, hours of don't, don't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope there is. I hope there's a record we can scratch it. Every, every, I'm every, sure there's every, a ten every, hour video of this on YouTube somewhere. Uh, so, we know is DJ Pib. It's what's credited for, so I have no idea. Um, if you want to go with a little more high score stuff, Starfire a year uh, year later let you actually enter your initials for the first time. So right. again, maybe not super influential, but these are like some arcade first right. for you to right. go along with. Yeah. Uh, Space Invaders definitely influential. So your Tato fact uh, about it not being a Japanese company, yep. a guy looked that up and actually wrote, he was like, I had to look this up. And it was, it was like some weird <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah, I think know? he was, uh, I can't remember what he was now that I'm thinking about it. I'd have to look in the comments of the last yeah, podcast. Yeah, definitely. Uh, watch the last podcast, you'll know what yeah, we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, watch them the all. So... Uh, what about you, Remember, Do you have another one uh, past Space Invaders? And you're more than welcome to jump around if you like. Yeah, yeah. I'll just go through one because um, this has led to a lot of new stuff coming up and a lot of new games. But this could be tracked back to uh, a game in 1986 called Chiller. Oh, know, yeah. If, Chiller. You know, it was the, uh, the first game that actually had blood and gore in it. Oh, uh, that was yeah. against humans. There is there stuff that, you know... There's some older games where you could like, get splatted on the ground or mm-hmm. something like that, but it was always an animal. But Chiller actually was trying to be gory it was really and, gory yeah what, and do we know what year 
What year? Uh, 1986. 86. 1986. Okay. 1986. And uh, that game was was one that you got to choose to to do the gore. And, you know, as we know today, that's led up to a lot of other things. And people wanted to get more into it, which we can go into that in more detail later. But um, but it really set the, the mood that it wasn't just for children, that you could start putting more adult content into or more parental suggested content into games. And um, I'm not saying that was the one that started the craze, but it's... Sure. It's an example of someone thinking about that early on and knowing that it wasn't just for kids anymore. You know, this is a, a tiny tangent, but I, I don't. We're, we're close to the same age. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought we were. Yeah. So, um, when I was in when I was in high school or junior high, like if you played video games, you're kind of a nerd. You know, kind of a little bit of a of an outcast. Right. You know, we're today's kids. Everybody plays video games, and it's no big deal. So that's a, I, I bring that up because I think that having adult, an adult theme is kind of a a stepping stone in that in that evolution of Agreed. games becoming, you know, kind of cool for everybody. Right. And they went all out on Chiller. It was extremely gory. Like, extremely gory. Not for the time. For now, it's extreme. There was a topless girl in Chiller you blow yep. away. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. Full on. I mean, granted, it's like, you know, 8-bit Pixel eight, eight uh, pixelated. Yeah, it looks like Legos, but still. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a topless Lego girl with square nips, but uh, she... <laughs> You can shoot her, <laughs> so right. it's pretty. It's pretty rough. It's pretty gory. So, anyway, so that's chiller. But I'll, I'll take you backwards just a little bit. So the first video game controversy, again, via Google here right. or uh, where whatever website it was on, Death Race, nineteen seventy six. Oh yeah, I forgot all about that game. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. there was a little bit of a stir because you could run. It looked like people over. They would scream. And then a little cross would come up. Like, yeah, like you buried them in a tombstone right there. So I believe the game may have said those were gremlins you were running. That's over, what it was. That's that's uh, the gremlins that they said it was. But they looked very humanoid. humanoid. Yeah. So again, all pixels and uh, the artwork. If you've never seen a death race in person, which is actually pretty tough to see, uh, my wife loved this game when we went. And we played one in San Francisco at a really nice museum esque arcade there, and uh, it has. It looks like hot rods, like from the, you know, that hot rod, uh, gosh, the rat fink hot oh, rod. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But oh, they're, yeah. they're like death, you know, it's <laughs> like the hood, you know, and he's like cruising, just crushing, you know, people. What, what year was that? 1976. 76. So, yeah. First video game controversy yeah. is what I would say there. So, how about you, Mike? Do you have another game that you would consider? I think if we move uh, forward a little bit, um, I think I have this right. I may be wrong. Mm -hmm. Isn't Battlezone the first 3D game? That's a good question, and I don't have I th that. I think Battlezone is the first. It's vector, vector based, mm -hmm. right? Is the first true 3D game. 3D game. Yeah, there's a bunch of vectors that kind of came out in a lump. And if you don't know what a vector uh, graphics or vector monitor is, this is something you're not going to be able to really pick up on on anything you watch. Yeah. I suggest you go to a retro arcade that has something vector on the floor, a Tempest of Star Wars, a Red Baron, a Battle Zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, these graphics are, can you explain how a vector draws? Uh, yeah, well, so uh, I'll put a little animation on the screen, but a, a raster monitor draws line by line by line by line by line. It's basically just reading from memory and dumping each each pixel on the screen. A vector monitor is the board is using math and it's actually drawing a line using the um, the guns of the on the on the CRT and actually drawing a line at different angles instead of wiping back and forth. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty amazing. If you turn the fly back up on that, oh, you can actually so see gorgeous. the drawing of the line. You can see it pointing, which is really a cool effect, but it looks crazy. <laughs> you got to turn it back down so it's just showing you what you need to see. But uh, I don't know, to answer your question on if Battlezone was the first, but it certainly feels like it has depth to it. It feels I, 3D. I believe it has the record for being the first okay. game. I might be wrong. I love I it. Hey, if, it if, if you can think of another one, folks, just put it in the comments. We don't care about being wrong. We care about you <laughs> having fun. So, yeah. Uh, But yeah, Battlezone, it, to me, that feels absolutely correct, what you're saying. I, I just don't remember. But other games that were vector that had that 3D effect were Star Wars, mm -hmm. Red Baron, mm -hmm. uh, Battlezone. And uh, it was you were able to really pick up on that. Uh, and that was kind of it for a long time until you got into... More polygonal, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with polygons and whatnot, or you might consider something like a an i um, i robot or something that had some depth, and you could see something coming, or some of the like Sega stuff like Outrun and right. that, that has some sort of the scrolling, they, the parallax, and parallax. The scrolling. Yeah. Yeah. There's some parallax scrolling that yep. definitely gives depth. That's like the two 
two or three or five or nine different levels, levels of layers. Uh, yeah, the layers. But what do they call the um, it coming at you that like Afterburner and Hang On and Outrun did? There's a name for that. Oh, I thought it was just a 3D effect, you know. Just it like is. A- it's called 3D effect, according <laughs> to Roman. So we're going with 3D effect. <laughs> Below, put what the name of that is. Sega called it something. Yeah, let I us just, know what that is. It's some not- scaling or something. I forget what it is. Yeah. But, uh, Parallax is like the background moving at moving two different at paces, yep. so it does give a real 3D effect. This was more coming at you, and I don't remember what they called it, <laughs> unless I'm just totally wrong. So, right. yeah. um, so Mike, so you mentioned Battlezone. Tell us a little more. Well, I didn't. I wasn't actually planning on going oh, into my it. Oh, my bad. All right, this mic. I'll tell you that the military actually used that game. I think I heard that. Before. Yeah, like yeah. the military used that game in the for I don't know if it was for tank controls or practice or for fun. I don't know why, but the military actually used Battlezone. I thought you'd. You knew that was I did not know that. Yeah, that I that's actually, a fun, fun I actually game. pulled Battlezone just out of the. I wasn't prepared to talk about it. Oh, okay, <laughs> my bad. I thought, <laughs> I thought it was just a, a, I just a highly was influential a, game. Yeah, sorry, going to, I'm so sorry. 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 Uh, I thought you'd know all about it. Yeah, well, I, I just pulled one off the truck like 20 <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> what, do you, what about you, Roman? Do you have another game you think influential? Yeah, I think you could probably see where my trend is going with this. But in the 80s, in 1988, um, we had oh. a couple of games that came out that started a lot of talking and all that. One of them was Narc. Oh my God! And, um, you Skipping know, all the way up to Narc, I love <laughs> yeah, it. So we are going to jump around. Narc. Um, again, that's more of that. I, I'm looking at these games as being geared more towards adults at this point. Sure. You know, you're arresting people, you're shooting people, you're blowing them up in the streets. Absolutely. I, I think one of the big things too was, you know, the war on drugs back in the '80s and the '90s, oh, and yeah. and it had that. And then at the same time in '88, we had Splatterhouse that came out on, mm. on arcade, and. According to Google and all things internet wise, um, I believe that Splatterhouse was actually the first game Ooh. that had a parental advisory on it. Oh, really? That said, this is not for kids. Wow, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, didn't that's pretty good. Uh, another game that I, is a vector game, actually, uh, since you bring up vector, it's Asteroids. I feel like Asteroids was a huge influential game and a game changer. How do you feel? I totally agree. Can you agree with that one? Yeah, totally agree. How about you, my friend? I feel Asteroids, Asteroids was that first game that it was actually hard. You know, oh, that, that actually had a, a, hard game. a difficulty level that was that was beyond just, a, you know, move left and right and shoot, but your 360 movement going mm-hmm. in so, the screen, moving around. I felt that it was, when you played that, you're like, wow, you have so much movement freedom. I, that's, okay. that's it. I don't know if it was just because I was a kid and I didn't play a whole bunch of games and, you know, at the time that came out, and then I just don't remember now. But I remember when I played Asteroids as a kid, it was that free movement. Because every other game I'd always played, Pac-Man or whatever, you were yep. stuck in a maze or, you know, like uh, Galaga, you could only move back and forth across the bottom of the screen. You know, but with, with that game, you're free to go anywhere on the screen. That's true. Turn any direction, shoot any direction. Yep. Teleport, go through teleport. the screen, come out the other side. Yeah, it was, it was like very weird. open. Yeah, the neat thing about Asteroids, uh, it did feel like you were in space. Mm-hmm. Like, is it you were just, there was nothing, there was no boundary to it. it. You went everywhere. Now, you come right out the bottom or, you know, the, off the other side, which is pretty wild. And totally, I get lost in Asteroids. I don't right. know if y'all play it and you're like, okay, where'd my ship go? <laughs> like, uh, just oh, go I know where it. my ship goes. I always yeah. get blown up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, there it went. It exploded all over the screen. So, uh, but yeah, Asteroids, uh, this was the first. Um, multiple scores you could save multiple scores at the same time which is kind of cool um also and this got me thinking and i don't know the answer to this so if any one of you do what was the first game that used a joystick because asteroids doesn't even use a joystick oh. isn't that a fun one first game <laughs> that uses a joystick it's like computer space didn't have a joystick pong had paddle things that didn't have a joystick space invaders has buttons i mean gunfight uh had those like gun Joysticks. That's 1975. Oh. Do you know? I don't. Oh, I, I thought you I, had. I, an that's answer. what I said. I, I have yeah. no idea. I, I wish I had that down. It started making me think because well, I guarantee you somebody will leave it in the comments. Somebody tell us who. What was the first game that had a joystick? What What year did Frogger come out? I don't remember off the top of my head. I could say early 80s, pretty easily. Um, you know what? No, I don't have it. Sorry. I'm sorry. I don't have so that. So thinking of early games, I mean, that might be a way. We have Frogger. We have Pac-Man. Mm-hmm. We have. Um, Mike's gonna look it up. I have to drive him crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Joust. I mean, Joust. Joust has it. joysticks, so side to sides. Yep. I mean, Galaga has joysticks. Pac-Man has joysticks. So right. you're definitely looking at games from that, um, you know, those early '80s games that definitely have joysticks. Yep. But I just don't know what the first game with the joystick is. So very interesting. Not to give us a tangent, 
But uh, there you go. The earliest known electronic game joystick <coughs> with a fire button was released by Sega in 1969. Whoa. Game called Missile. 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 I don't know if that's an arcade game. I think game, that's though. an arcade, though. Yeah, because yeah. uh, if you would consider the arcade first would be 71, being computer space. So, anyway, sorry. I didn't mean to get you all off on a tangent. Well, yeah. if, anybody, if anybody does if figure anybody it out, knows. put it in the if comments. Knows, put it in the know. comments. That's what uh, podcasts are all about. <laughs> we figured it out ourselves. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Asteroids for me would have been a very influential game. I think that... Uh, it did a lot, you know, pushing forward in the industry there. Uh, after that, I would say you start getting into some real heavy hitters. Uh, can you think of any? Well, again, that's when we start getting into Pac-Mans and, and Joust. And, Absolutely. Uh, those are ones that you see everywhere. Everyone's played one of those. Um, oh. I think that there's... Um, Speaking of joysticks, Robotron and its dual joysticks. Robotron, dual joysticks. Absolutely. That's a great... That's a um, Eugene Jarvis uh, mm -hmm. Eugene invent. Jarvis. Yep. Uh, but you know, you he's like a savant, I think. By the way, for, huh? for arcades, <laughs> who's that? Jarvis is. Like oh a my savant god, he's like the arcades. godfather of fantastic <laughs> games. I mean, anything that's that um, Williams into Bally Midway, or after they, after they purchased Midway, and they were just Midway in the '90s. I mean, Eugene Jarvis. You mentioned Narc. He's yep. involved in that NBA Jam. Um, gosh, Robotron, Smash TV. These are all Jarvis. Uh, wow. Oh, uh, Cruising USA. <laughs> Cruising USA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, uh, all the way up, he's in with Raw Thrills now, I'm pretty sure. Really? Or he's been, you yeah. know. So your Cruising Blast and things like that would probably be some inspiration there. Yeah. So I have a game. Okay, go right ahead. I think changed the game that came out uh, not too far after those. Dragon's Lair. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. Dragon's Lair. <laughs> Dragon's Definitely. Lair. So tell us about Dragon's so, Lair. So Dragon's Lair, I, I think probably most people are familiar with it. But it, um, you know, back in those days... Um, Processing and memory and all that was a premium, right? Sure. So, so all of these boards were designed to get the most bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. um, and even with, I mean, like supercomputers of the day, you couldn't do a lot of the things that we did today with an with a iPhone, you know, right? Right. And so they were looking for a way to bring arcades and games to the next level of graphics, but they couldn't do it through their processors and memory and, and all that. So what they did, it came up with a genius idea. Well, we could record a lot of those graphics on a laser disc mm -hmm. and play them back on command. So rather yeah. than have the computer have to render it, it's playing it from a file. Right. Know, right. It's a genius idea. It's kind of a quick time event. Quick time event. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. invention of the quick exactly time event. Is. Yeah. So uh, that was a genius idea. And of course it was a smash hit and, and everybody loves that game. Some people complain about it because it's sure. predictable, right? It's just a matter of remembering. Yeah, it's the most predictable it. game that no one knows how to play. And everyone <laughs> says, this is so hard, <laughs> right? I have had more than one person here at the Starship tell me it's broken. Oh yeah, they just have no idea. <laughs> they, they, think they're, they think they're just watching the demo, right. you know, because uh, they're actually playing a cartoon. It looked different than anything that was out at the anything. time. Anything. Yep. You know, next, totally and, next level. And that led to Space Ace, Space, Space Ace, Ace 2. You know, those are some good games. They, they were very unique, very different. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, Dragon's Lair's, um, you know, considered the first full motion video game. Uh, now, there's an argument there for Astron Belt. It came out in the same year. So, depending on who released what right. first uh, and where you were yeah. and, you know, when these games came out. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, a laser disc, quick time event cartoon with a former Disney illustrator, Don Bluth. <laughs> uh, I mean, we're, we're talking like when you saw it, and I think it was 50 cents. It might have been the first game that was 50 it might have cents. Been, yeah. You know, uh, in the back in the day when a quarter was the premium and, and that was yeah. uh, what you, you know. And it, that it, really, I don't know if if how common knowledge this is, but it really affected a lot of or molded a lot of future games. Like, example, on PC, like mm -hmm. Wing Commander is a CD-based game, you know, right? right? It's a hugely popular game of the of the era. Same exact design style, though. Sure. It's you fight a little bit here, you know, in the 3D space, but then it flips to a um, a video where you're kind of watching the game mm -hmm. in in the cutscenes and stuff. It's just right. it really that's the Sega CD, yeah, that, yeah. You know, computer-based yeah. games. Sure, yeah, exactly, uh, absolutely. Uh, all right, so Dragon's Lair, that's a great one. Uh, I would say we can't skip over Pac-Man. <laughs> so we're talking <laughs> wampa, about a, a game that had so much cultural impact. Uh, maybe the first video game character? 
Yeah, probably. Uh, you know, as far as a character, certainly uh, the first uh, majorly branded one. <laughs> right, totally. Yeah. And we're talking when he says majorly branded. Think of all. I want you to just both imagine. All right, you imagine five Pac-Man things. You imagine five Pac-Man things. We're talking. There's an album, a Pac-Man Fever. Uh, <laughs> every kind of mug, cup, plate, every kind of lunchbox, cartoons. Tunes. Video game, other video, video games that are based uh, on a Pac Man land, yeah, you know. Pac so they, they oh, took the that Pac Man and man. yeah, the oh, spin offs yeah. off of all yeah. that, yeah. Pac Man, Miss Pac Man, Baby Pac Man, Pac Man Jr., Pac Land, Professor Pac Man, oh my god, it just keeps Pac Mania, Battle like Royale, Mario. yeah, <laughs> I totally like everything you can, um, but yeah, the, the cartoons, the every you want to talk about something that's if you think video game, something that's ultra recognizable, Pac Man. So, what do you think? And I have an idea, but I want to hear what you, what you guys hey, think. it's on your shirt. Pac-Man. <laughs> <laughs> what are the there odds? we go. <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> you didn't even know. <laughs> so snuck what on. do you think um, caused that? Why is Pac-Man so... I have theories. Um, one, anyone can play it. Uh, it only takes one hand to play it. So even if you're only got one hand, you can play it. <laughs> no, just, yeah. if you have something else in your other hand, you can play it. <laughs> oh, my God. I think that um, the the fact that it's easy to play and tough to master is fun because it keeps you going back for a high score. I feel like it's uh, across all race, gender. It, there, there's no lines for Pac-Man. Uh, you know, I think... Just as many men and women, they both like Pac-Man. Kids like Pac-Man. It's still, if you said, hey, uh, we are going to turn all these free-to-play games back to coin-based, I guarantee it would still earn something uh, as opposed to the other yeah. uh, older retro games of its time. Um, so those are some of the things that I would think. Mm -hmm. How about you? I don't know what Roman thinks. I think simplicity has to be the best one. I mean, anybody can go up to it and play it. And um, I think that there was different versions of it. People look for it. And at the very, very beginning, just the root of it, I think that just seeing the little cutscene on it when you're going across. Oh, yeah. Getting rewarded Is for doing Is it the first things. game with a cutscene? Yeah, th there, was, there was like little rewards I into totally, it. Yeah. Um, and also, like I said, you're, you're actually getting chased. So you feel like you're getting chased. No other game did that at the beginning. You weren't being chased by something. You were just trying to complete an objective. This sure. time you have ghosts coming after you there's that excitement people watched it and i know everyone got pissed off when they got, got hit by a ghost you know? i wonder why they gave it ghosts <laughs> i don't know i mean i know the pac-man idea was obviously like that someone was eating a pizza and they pulled the pizza and like it's just like i forget the creator pac-man's name i apologize but mm -hmm. yeah um he's like oh there it is and his name's puck man over yep. in Japan. <laughs> Why is his name not Puckman here? Because you could easily change that to an F and people would really have fun with it. Yeah. Oh my Isn't that God. sad? Oh my God. That's so sad. <laughs> At least so, they understood. We knew who we were. <laughs> Even back in the 80s, we knew what kind of trash humans Absolutely. we were. <laughs> I think that uh, part of the reason that Pac-Man became so popular so quickly, just from a gameplay perspective, no manual required, so easy to like mm -hmm. you don't have it takes five seconds you look at that game and you know what the goal is right yeah you want to talk about a game that you don't have to read the instructions you can figure it out pretty quick it's like okay i'm, I'm dots are disappearing as i move mm -hmm. these things are clearly and not edible after you eat one and try to i was like oh wait they are if i get a power pellet that might have been the first power up in a game right. you know that, that yeah. i can't think of yeah. uh you know so we're talking cutscenes, power up uh you know Just incredibly low barrier early game. early use of joystick um it was a black background game without being set in space <laughs> which is probably right. pretty and it's a maze game which that i will say might be one of the biggest impacts because after that Maze games are everywhere, right? Yeah. So we, yeah. we've uh, got maze games. Ladybug. Yeah, Ladybug. Yeah. Um, what is that one? Casey Munchkin or something on the television? I, oh, I don't know. Right. Or that's whatever right. that was on. So you started getting a lot of knockoff Pac-Mans, the, the glob. Or whatever, I, this, so. and if you're going to hear all about Pac-Man and my disdain for the Atari 2600 version, Ooh. <laughs> see us in the next podcast. Next podcast. Right. I have something on that, too. Matter of fact, I may have a show-and-tell uh, cartridge for you to see in the next podcast. Hey, I got so. a question about Pac-Man as well, and this may be something with marketing, too. Mm -hmm. Were there any cabinets that offered cartoony side art that would bring kids into it because i've seen there's other side art but it was always the well, 80s art was awesome you gotta, oh, you gotta admit pac-man side art's total 
cartoon. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I wonder if that helped attract I don't the know. younger audience. He had to look feet at it. and stuff yeah. on the side art, I believe. So. so I had. I don't remember what it was. It was some like little calculator device that was like black and white LCD that played mm. some kind of rip off of Pac Man. Oh yeah, yeah. I think there were watches that did yep. a little. I actually had one of those Pac Man <laughs> watches. There's a little Coleco tabletop. Uh, you know, so now we're getting into home ports. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. right. Next podcast. That's the next podcast. One. That's anyway, Pac Man, and then you know, even better game, Miss Pac Man. Was it the first female character in a video game? I'm not sure. It might be. Might be. Might be. Look it up, it folks. Is. Tell us. We didn't get all the facts, apparently. So, but anyway. So, I would say Pac-Man. That's the cultural impact, everything there. It's it's fantastic. But you might. You got another one? Another one. Is it my turn again? I mean, it doesn't have to be. I mean, I have, one with a really <laughs> good, nice. I have one with a really good story that goes with it. Okay. But it's jumping ahead quite a bit. Okay. You got an older yeah. age one so, or you want to so, jump ahead? Yeah, I, I'm still up in the in the future. Okay, these, come on. You know, but but I, I'm just really digging into my past on what, what sure. I saw. That's, man, that's so, okay. I, I'm going to say a game that I don't think is the best. Mm-hmm. But what came after it is. Okay. Right? So um, in 1987, Street Fighter came out. Oh, the yeah. The first yeah. Street Fighter. Yeah. yeah. And uh, not a great game, but I hear there's a, a new port of it out. That yeah, maybe yeah. Coming uh, to, uh, a, to an arcade near you. to an arcade near you. <laughs> Watch this YouTube channel here on Electric Starship Arcade. We, again, we're based on two channels. So you may be watching the Time Rift channel. You may be watching the Electric Starship Arcade channel. Subscribe to both. You know, yeah, who knows? Uh, you, you're going to see different content Good on both. Good things will happen to you. Yeah, you will. If you like arcades uh, and arcade-related material, you definitely want to subscribe to both. But, uh, yeah, we have, uh, yeah, so we're working fun. on a little something. Yep. So definitely wait to get that out here. So if you're in the area, stop by. And once that's finally out on the floor, you get to see some uh, some really good Street Fighter game that you never knew existed. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but what's so important about that, that it led to Street Fighter 2. Right. And Yeah, which is... Street Fighter 2 is... There has been a lot of things that have happened in, this, in, in the whole history of video games. But I'd be hard-pressed to tell me that there wasn't a game that just changed everything when Street Fighter 2 hit. I agree. Uh, it spawned so many uh, competitors to want to beat. Them. Oh my God! It spawned a fighting genre that really wasn't even a genre before that. Correct. And you know, even today, these games are still coming out. They're still trying to be better than the next. And you know, it's led to more stuff, which we'll cover that next. But definitely, Street Fighter. It's the the combos that you had on it coming down with your special moves and and then they kept on improving onto it so you know we so, came from a, an age of no DLC so Roman but for, they kept on re updating it for a guy like me that I was really never into fighting games you know right and I kind of still am <laughs> sorry guys so <laughs> but I'm still really not that into it today um, help us understand like. From because there were other fighting games before that, right? Right. Um, you know, like Karate Champ or something, right? What makes this better, right? Tell tell us that. So I think one of the big things is that it gave you a roster of characters that you didn't have on other games. Uh, some of the other games had one or two. Street Fighter Two gave you a roster of characters. <laughs> yeah, very clear. Two. We want to make sure we understand. Street, Street Fighter, Fighter One two. gave you two characters, <laughs> just like Karate Champ. <laughs> so go ahead. So so it gave you a roster. So it gave you a different way to play the game. It's not just you get this character, you fight your way to the end, you get done. You have your skill set, your your special moves that's different, except for Ryu and Ken, because they're, you know, trained the same way. Sure. But sure. you have these multiple of characters so you could adapt and you could play the character that you felt better with or whatever play style you liked. You could be faster, you could be slower, more powerful, you could be weaker. You know, you had all these options in there. But then they put in the special moves where you're trying to do button combinations and right. it turned into more of just a joystick to move left and right but you're having to learn these moves to do it. It wasn't a game that you could just go to and just pick it up, except, you know, keep smashing the buttons and you Yeah, because that's win, all I needed. You know, <laughs> but I can tell you right now that I don't know anyone that doesn't know what Street Fighter is. That's you know, another one it's, that's very influential. You say, hey, Street Fighter 2, and they're like, oh, yeah, and they may never have never played it, but they know what it is. Absolutely. You know, they're hey, going to know. That. I'm it's wearing a Street, Street Fighter Street Fighter right so, there. Represent. So, <laughs> funny story, probably about the same time that we learned about this other game that you hinted at there's also a street fighter 2 restore coming out on the time rift channel. oh yeah so there you go that's a, two of them back to back two street fighters for the price of one right and, and i know i mentioned this earlier but just talking about dlc you know we didn't have all that stuff but mm. how many different versions of street fighter 2 are there? there's a rainbow edition oh my there's God. turbo oh my edition gosh. i want they, to write that down yeah there's, th there's so many different versions and it's not even a different game it's oh just no. mods added to the same game to make it's, it better it's 
There's Street Fighter 2. We're going with Street Fighter 2. Street yeah. Fighter 1 is not the influential game, no, by the Street way. Fighter it's Street 2. Fighter 2. Street Fighter yeah, 2. So <laughs> be very clear. It, that's the one that changed and created. It basically revived arcades. Uh, so yes. arcades after the crash in 83. You got some great games from, you know, 84 through 92-ish. I, I don't remember when Street Fighter 2 came out, but um, yeah, it was early in, 90s, 91, yep. 92, somewhere in there. Um, 91. 91. There you go. So Wait, wait, wait. So Street Fighter 1 came out in... in no, no, 87. 1, 87. There was no. that much time between Yep. It? Wow. Yeah, 87 and 91. Uh, so, But Street Fighter 2 didn't... Didn't do the trick, but Street, or Street Fighter 1 didn't. Street Fighter 2 is what did Correct. it. And then you had Street Fighter 2. You had Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition. Yeah. You had Street Fighter 2 Hyper. Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Street Fighter 2 Hyper Turbo. Street right. Fighter 2 The Movie The Game. Street Fighter right. 2. I mean, it just went on and on. Uh, and I know I'm missing a few in there. And then the, obviously the ones that were bootlegged from other countries. So right. this was so popular that uh, other countries started making this board set. And then these ones were coming over where the moves would be it incredibly broken uh, <laughs> you, where you fly ball, across the screen you shoot flyer ball you can change character mid game yep and these were these like uh bootleg ones right. that were coming over and they were called the rainbow edition because they would have different color palette on the um the street fighter logo the street fighter logo right. which had, would ombre to different colors it would have like a rainbowy looking one wow. right and so if you get a rainbow board set you may be able to just hit the start button and keep changing characters mid fight you may throw a fireball and eight fireballs come out you know just <laughs> crazy stuff uh, if anyone's interested you could buy those chips and convert it over. Oh, yeah, you can yeah, totally you can convert buy, to a convert rainbow it, yep. edition, which is super cool. We actually have some. I've never <laughs> done anything with it. They're just here. So, yeah, you can convert an actual board to the rainbow chipset. Like just pulling the chips ROM set, Yep, you know, just so. change a couple of ROMs. Yeah, it's not bad at all. It's I easy. wonder, we could probably come up with a, like a little Arduino switcher thing where we could have both Ooh, games. Ooh, that'd be really cool. We should totally yeah. try to figure that out. Secret rainbow edition. Bam! Yep. You just hit the button. Yep, so. and we, we talked about, you know, Pac-Man having all the stuff that came out with it. There's so oh much like happening with Street Fighter. There's an anime series out oh, there. There's yeah. comic book series. There's action figures. There's, mm -hmm. you know, there's G.I. Joe. Yeah, there was. G.I. Joe X-Men. There's, you know, oh, yeah. there, there, there's so much stuff that, that, was, that has been crossed over with them. Mm -hmm. And even today, it's still evolving. So this isn't like, you know, Pac-Man has come out. And correct me if I'm wrong, put it in the comments. But I don't know of any new pac-man innovations that have come out but yeah have a couple of Actually, four player games but it's the battle royale, yeah, the Bo Championship royale. Edition. Championship edition. Yeah. and uh, you know those but there's been so many different iterations of street fighter and what you do and how you play and who the characters are it's always in development it's hit from every console has had street fighter including the new ones ps5 xbox one x they they have new street fighter games on them and it's it's a legacy that keeps going so i don't want to segue quite yet but the um Help me out with time frame. Mortal Kombat one. Well, that's uh, it's ninety two. That say that ninety two. So it's real close. Okay, really close. Yep, it's actually ni ninety two. Like you said, Mortal Kombat. But again, that was that's why Street Fighter two was so influential because it spawned the next iteration of the fighting game, in which I think is Mortal Kombat, which is fighting directly against Street right. Fighter. Yeah. They wanted to get a piece of that pie. So you're. Coke, Pepsi, your, yep. uh, you know, what it's like, Apple versus IBM. I, mean, <laughs> I can't remember yeah. the, the new one, Sprite versus Sprite. Uh, no, 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 no. No, there's a new one. What's that What's yellow it? can? Yeah. That's what it is. Uh, Starry? Starry. 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 That's Starry. not real. That's not a real. I'm talking I, about that. I see it I'm talking everywhere about now. Sega Genesis versus the Nintendo <laughs> yeah. PlayStation. Yeah, I'm talking about the ba all time battles. Now we're getting into one with right. a fighting game battle here because. Uh, Star Trek, Star Wars. I would give you that one. Okay, uh, yep. You know, so the uh, we're talking. You were a Street Fighter kid, or you were a Mortal Kombat kid. Yep. And, and that's what actually were you? That, I was a Street Fighter kid, but, but and you know you were neither. I was neither. Neither. Yeah. All right. And that, that's I mean, the I next thing I, I was going karate to. Champ. <laughs> was that Mortal Kombat when it came out? I mean, Street Fighter just did all that. And again, right. I'm, not, I'm not saying that Mortal Kombat owes its roots to Street Fighter, but I, I would say if, if there was never a Street Fighter, would there ever have been a Mortal Kombat? Is that's a great question, and yeah. I think Street Fighter's absolutely as far as influencing fighting games as a genre. That was it. Uh, do you know what the first fighting game was, just for fun? I don't. Okay. So, first fighting game, 1976, Heavyweight Champ. And it's a really hard fi game to find really? even footage of, right? But it's two big, giant sprites. As a matter of fact, it may... Uh, would that predate your uh, sprite, uh, 1978? Yeah, it would. I mean, we're talking big big boxers like they're this big <laughs> on the screen and I've, I've literally found a news report 
The only way I could even find, I was like, what is this game, heavyweight fight or heavyweight champ? There was a one that was very similar named mm -hmm. much later that had some really cool uh, kind of punchy sticks with little guards like you have on a foil of a, huh. you know, jousting foil or whatever. <laughs> um, but anyway, the from 1976, there's a game called Heavyweight Champ and it has these big sprites. And I found a news report talking about video games in general and the kid is playing it in that. And that's really the only footage I can wow. find of this game. So it's pretty wow. great. Wow. Okay. So, I'll, I'll anyway, take some pictures. Of first it. fighting game right there, <laughs> 1976. But back to Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat. I was a Mortal Kombat kid. And when I saw the, and I loved Street Fighter and the kids that had it on Super NES, it was awesome, and I couldn't figure it out, and I would just right. get stomped at this game. But where, you know, me not knowing how to play that game, where there's something different when I saw Mortal Kombat, it was like, okay, it's worth it. I have right. to learn because I got to know how. And just with, if you want to hear a story, I went to Forum 303 Mall, which is not there anymore, and obviously the arcade's not there anymore. <laughs> and I went in, and there were kids surrounded around this game. I, where almost you couldn't see, and I kind of weaseled my way in where I could see the screen, and the first thing I see is uh, Sub-Zero tear Raiden's head off <laughs> and leave, <laughs> sprays blood, the spinal Spines. cord, the spine, and the, you know, it's, it's hanging from his head, and the screen goes black, and I'm just like, I, my mind was completely blown, and my right. whole way I looked at video games was changed. And I know there were games like Chiller, and I know there was yeah. games like Narc, you know, you mentioned, yep. <laughs> and these games that had blood in them before, but I had never seen that. And you want to talk about a controversy. Well, that's, that that's where I was, controversy. yeah, so that's actually what I was going to go to next was that going into Mortal Kombat um, in 1994, it got ported over. So people back in the day, and I say back in the day when we were younger, they, they didn't pay attention to what was going on at the arcade. They paid attention to what was going on in your house. Right. All of a sudden, Mortal Kombat went from the arcade, and it got ported to home. <laughs> and now, all of a sudden, this was like Satan rearing its head up in everybody's oh household. Then you have it going to Congress. They talked about Mortal Kombat in Congress. Yeah, that's amazing. And, Mortal uh, Kombat and, and Night Trap was the yes, other one. Yes, Night got Trap in was the other one. And uh, and in uh, 1994, they came out with the uh, with the AMA for the arcades mm -hmm. because they were doing the. I wanted to make sure they put ratings up because they kind of felt that spark was going to go towards uh -huh. arcades. But that's where the ESRB, I think it's called, mm -hmm. uh, started as well, where they had yeah. to start rating games. You know, if you go back and play those games now, it's nothing compared to what we had. No, sure. You know, you know, play the Mortal Kombat that he yeah. built right in there. You know, yeah. We'll see. Uh, and Night Trap, for instance, I actually own that game. Uh -huh. And I own very few iterations of it. I got a Sega CD. I got on. Oh, know. okay. And uh, it's cool. one of the things that's in my, my collection. And it's. I'd let my kids play it with no right, issue. Right, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think I've seen more violence in a Disney movie than I have in that game. <laughs> you know, and that's a thing. Uh, time frames are just what people get in an uproar over. You know, I, I remember sitting with my grandparents watching horror movies in the 80s. So, like, right. it, people became protective at different times. But I can tell you what it did for me. If you told me I was not supposed to watch something or not <laughs> supposed to play something. Same here. I am the first. I was like, well, I'm going to go play this. So exactly. I got to understand my, why. My dad, we, him and I had our first probably big fight. I mean, like, teenage fight over RoboCop. He did not want me to see <laughs> RoboCop. And the first thing I did was go down oh, yeah. when, when the, he was at work and rent the VHS. See, and, and me and my grandpa <laughs> sit in his lap and watch RoboCop. You know? <laughs> like, I was like, it was, uh, you know, we just, uh, I guess my grandparents were pretty, like, whatever. Talking about Mortal Kombat in general, there's there's some a few more things I would like to say. One, we're talking about the maybe the first game that had a hidden fighting game character. Oh, uh, Tobias Boone in there at the, well, no, no, the no, Toasty? The, or the, 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 no, no, oh, no, no. Um, no, Toasty came along in Mortal Kombat 2, and that was Dan Ford, and he was the sound right. designer. But the first hidden character, Reptile. Reptile. In never, the pit, uh, you know? I, I would say he's the first hidden character in a game, but or, or an arcade game. I think there's obviously, we're talking adventure, may have the first Easter egg. So right. there's a lot of like variations, but he's definitely the first hidden fighting game character was Reptile, which was a combination of the yellow and blue palette, which made green. Right. For all of you that haven't studied color. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, he was at the bottom of the pit, and it was a nightmare getting to him. Yep. Uh, and I don't even know if the early versions of Mortal Kombat necessarily had them had him in there, because they started giving you like hints. He would like pop on the screen and oh, yeah. say little uh, hints about what to do. And perfection is the key. So yeah. vague. Yeah. Like stuff spelled backwards about yep. the moon and the silhouette. So basically, the way I remember it, you couldn't get hit. 
in two yeah. two out of the three rounds. So you had to win flawlessly, a double flawless, perform a fatality. Um, you couldn't hit block, maybe, or was that the babalities in the next game? I, I don't can't know. Remember. But the key here was there was a pit level, a pit stage. It was called a pit because you could punch someone and they you get an auto fatality, just fall into a yeah. pit and both spikes. And you're fighting on a bridge above it. And in the background, it's dark. It's nighttime. I'm just painting the picture here, guys. It's <laughs> night. I'm going on a date the here. The moon right? was the full. The moon was full. <laughs> and uh, in the moon, there would be, if you were lucky, you just happen to be on that cycle of levels because, you know, it'd go through seven or eight levels. And then when you hit the pit stage, if you hit the pit stage and there was a silhouette going across the moon and it would either be a witch on a broom, yep. it'd be Santa and some reindeer, it'd be a little spaceship yep. but if it's going across that moon this is your moment and you've got a double flawless fatality maybe not hit block if i'm remembering correctly <laughs> i don't remember all of it but um if you did all those things on that particular stage at that particular time you got to fight reptile at the bottom of the pit right and it was the only way to do it so wow really tough really yeah. really tough to see so you know when you got that game home talking about home ports right that's what you tried to do which was right. really tough on the home port too so yeah, and I think that, um, you know, we're just talking about fighting games in general. What came after Mortal Kombat is in 93, we had a uh, Virtua Fighter come out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I know we're just talking about another fighting game, but now that spawned two different directions that fighting games went. So this is the way I see it. And again, there's nothing that says this in the rule books, but I think that you have your Street Fighter games mm -hmm. that are going to have your special moves. And I would even lump Mortal Kombat in that because you got your freeze, you got your, your combos that you can do. Um, and then I think it goes to your virtual fighter your tekken your dead or alive where those games are more on a plane where you could sidestep go through you could do uh, uh more combos a lot of right. more button mashing on those um and i'm not gonna say it's not technical because there's definitely some great players out there and i'm not the technical person on those but i think that's really what spawned those fighting games with trying to say okay they've already done this we could do something else but it all still roots back to how do we beat street fighter <laughs> so yeah the street fighter yeah. having the multiple characters you could select uh is street fighter 2 and then that really set the f fighting game genre on fire and then mortal kombat comes out with um, brutality <laughs> uh, these yeah, yeah they come out with fatality so a way to finish yep. your character and finish just adding fight. blood and gore and adding it. blood and gore finishing the, the fatalities were that and that was right. what was different for me also digitized graphics yep. at that point motion NARC capture. had digitized graphics and then going back in the day journey yeah. uh had like the band members of journey's little heads and just a couple of frames of them right. so digitized graphics were a new thing so then you had all these copycats that were trying to do that until you know virtual fighter which you know led to t what i believe tekken would be right and to me this is the creme de la creme of fighting is the mortal kombat street fighter and tekken right. after that you know maybe virtual fighter i would throw in but it starts falling off killer instinct yeah. killer you want to talk about combos killer oh, instinct yeah. was super influential with combos right. but um so that that's really covers the fighting game genre really right. well uh i think we'd be um, remiss if we didn't mention a few more influential games from yeah. back in the early 80s. Uh, I think Donkey Kong. Oh, for sure. You know, yeah. we're talking about a game that's had, I mean, gosh, there's lawsuits about Donkey Kong, right? One of these days, I'm going to have another arcade. It's just, or I think it's going to be just like an arcade themed bar. I'm gonna okay. Call it, I'm going to call it the. Uh, uh, hammer and barrel. <laughs> oh, I I'm, it's awesome. I, there's Trademark no panda way pendant. that hasn't been taken. <laughs> Probably. Um, hammer and barrel bar and grill or an arcade. Go ahead and just put your plug in. I guarantee that you ain't getting out of it. Button no. mat. I mean, there's all that one's taken. I, I guarantee. But I love the name. I love that name. So uh, I love hammer and barrel. But yeah, Donkey Kong. Um, gosh, is. Is, what is that considered? What do you, I, I, when you're trying to list games like on a website, like I have this many shooters and this many fighting games, this, I can just put Donkey Kong and Pac Man like classics. That's but what where do you, I put it too, yeah. Just classic? classic. But is it a platform? No, a platform, classic platformer is, is what I would it. Is it really a platformer? Yeah, I mean, though? you're, yeah, because platform, you're jumping, you're, oh, you have these an are my favorite to, kind of conversation. You start, you try to bring them up. <laughs> you know, I, I would, I would think that it's a platform, but it's only a single stage platformer. It's not a multiple stage platform. Okay, I can you go know, with you know, that. I can get on board. Ooh, single stage platformer. It's a single stage you better put a yeah. TM at the end of that, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> reserve that right. Yeah, a little R on there or something. Uh, I like that. That's really good. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't. I wouldn't know what to call Donkey Kong, but you know, I love the fact that uh, it's one of those games where you're not basically you know, Galaga again, another super influential game. I think it's the best of the space shooters. You know, uh, uh, but 
you are playing on what seems to be the same stage. You'll get some different sprites to shoot out of the sky, but Donkey Kong are different levels. Yep. You know, you're going to another level. Even Pac-Man didn't. Miss Pac-Man did have different mazes, but even Pac-Man doesn't really have different levels. I mean, it has like it ups the challenge yeah. by the the time the ghosts, you know, stay blue or whatever before you can eat them. <laughs> so, uh, pole position. I can't think of a whole lot of sit down drivers. I mean, that was a stand up, but it did have a cockpit. Um, right over there. I can't think of any as well. There's one. I, yeah. I will tell you though that you know I'm not sure what what is the first game with the steering wheel because that's well Death Race spawned, definitely had a steering wheel yeah. that spawned everything too. Well, there was a lot it. of games pre. Um, video game that had steering wheels. So a lot of your games that um, like Chicago Speedway, like these old Chicago coin games, the electromechanical. Yeah, I think that's the one wheel. I was. I can't. I could. I don't know the name it, of it. Is but that there the was, one where the car would just go back and forth? And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, so yeah. There was one I played at like Six Flags that had like a cardboard cutout that moved yeah. when you yeah. turned the steering wheel. And totally. So yeah. steering wheel games go back a ways, but uh, as far as that really cool third person you're kind of behind uh, you know a lot of the racing games like turbo you're kind of above the car more it does go yeah. forward a little bit but there's a lot of games where you feel like you're above it this one you're on that really pretty good third person view i mean you couldn't hit it to first person but you, yeah in future games right. it's a button away there was also a game that amusement parks had that um it had like the you had a steering wheel and a gas pedal and but what you were actually doing was moving a camera Oh. On a racetrack, Ooh, huh. yeah. I can't remember what that was called either. But so it felt like you were moving. That's but cool. You, but you're really just moving a, a camera on a little. I mean, like a little miniature set, like you know, right in front of you. Oh, that's awesome. The so there's a lot of great electric. And I don't even know games. now that you now I say it. I don't even know if it's a camera. I think it might have been a optical effect. Oh, totally. Or, it probably yeah, was. Yeah. Yeah. The, the first steering wheel game I ever played was Spy Hunter. Oh really? I, I remember oh, it. it. Doesn't have a steering oh, wheel. Yeah. It, the, the one I the one I had, I played had a little steering wheel. No, it's just steering wheel, Spy Hunter. Dude, it. <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely has to. It has like a U-shaped thing. It's yeah, like it's, a flight it's a, thing. Yeah, you know, isn't, isn't that? Isn't that what? Uh, um, Sorry to uh, clap in the mic. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Is, isn't that what Knight Rider had too? Oh, I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, but uh, the Tesla has that now too. Oh yeah. gosh, yeah. It's yeah, it didn't, yeah. it didn't have a wheel. It didn't have a wheel. It had a steering, steering mechanism. Yeah, it had a steering device. So Sorry, they call it a yoke. A yoke. A there yoke. you go. Uh, yeah. See, to me, a yoke would. Give you right. some forward back motion right. too, like a Star Wars or um, what's another yoke game? A Return of the Jedi. I oh, yeah. see it right there here. So, yep. um, anyway, so that well, would be an I, influential game. I have a segue from from that. Um, uh, it came out in 1989. Mm -hmm. Is hard driving? Oh yeah, hard driving's cool. Hard driving, good... I think, like radically changed the game as far as like it was the very first game driving game that was a full simulator. Mm -hmm. And I have a great story about this too, but. So it it has force feedback on like everything. Like you can't like shift gears because there's a magnet on the on the gear shift unless you let off the gas. You know, just a little wow. bit. You know, kind of like it has everything that you can imagine. Just force feedback on the steering wheel. Um, I actually learned you're gonna people are gonna think I'm crazy. I actually learned <laughs> how to drive stick shift on that game. Really? I did. That's, That's pretty cool. Also, so I played this game, played this game, played this game, and and a clutch. It has a clutch. And it's force feedback wow. clutch and everything. I remember it had a key. That was it had a key. Uh, that was cool. Uh, by the way, we have one of these in our collection. It's not finished. We haven't finished the restore process. Right. It was really tough to find the monitor. Hey, hey, found yeah, you a monitor. Yeah, you found me a monitor. Yeah. Right. And, and for all you young people, clutch was something that used to be in cars when you had to drive. Yeah. <laughs> so look up standards. <laughs> so like cockpit. <laughs> <laughs> different uh, <laughs> definitions of clutch now. Yeah. <laughs> clutch free throw shooter or yeah. being clutch. You know, yeah. That's so. So I had a buddy, Chris Phillips, if uh, he happens to be watching this. Uh, we hang out in high school. He had a green Ford pickup truck, uh, uh, standard manual transmission. Nice. And he asked me one day if I could move it like from the front of the house to somewhere else. And I had never driven, oh. never driven a standard, but I had played that hard driving game and I just like went with it. I was, no. totally, I was totally able to drive it. It was totally. The, the first, it's odd, my my buddy Topher, like Chris, right, you're right. So that was the first clutch I drove was his truck. But we had to like move his stuff to a college like way up north. So, but uh, yeah, my dad, my dad threw me the keys to one. Said, "Hey, you got to go deliver auto glass." And that's how I in Dallas traffic's where I really learned. Oh, that one. So yeah. that was, it was yeah. tough. I can tell you right now, uh, Brandon, he comes over here uh, mm -hmm. every once in a while to play games. When a friend, I've been friends with him forever. Um, his parents had an MGB, a little car from oh, overseas. Oh. Nice. Never had driven standard. He said, "Hey, let's go move this car." And I sure did almost put it through the fence and tie it on the brake before God. I went through. It, so. Everybody's got a rough clutch story. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
If you're our age, <laughs> if yeah. you're listening yeah, to this that, 20 that, that years earlier, maybe not. But I feel like um, I feel like a lot of the modern games built off of that technology. And by the way, when hard driving came out, it was like one of the most expensive games ever. Oh yeah, you know it was super expensive. In fact, Atari almost canceled it before it ever got off the ground, which is costing too much. Wow. So, yeah, that's wild. So we mentioned Donkey Kong, Pole Position, Dragon's Lair. How about a four-player game, Gauntlet? Gauntlet. Was there a four-player oh, game before yeah. Gauntlet? Can you think of one? I couldn't think of one. Uh, so I would say in 1985, the first four-player game. And you know, it's really hard to try to find the first three-player game. I mean, Rampage? Maybe. You know? That's the you know, only Gauntlet. three-player game I know. <laughs> uh, I can get you know, Moonwalker, Combat Tribes. Um, there's some other three-player. Obviously, Rampage World Tour. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can think of some three-player games, but uh, I just can't think of any one before Rampage, and, I, and that one's not listed, but I'm pretty sure Gauntlet's the first four-player game. Yeah, Gauntlet is the first game that I remember like being in an arcade, and you just always walked up to it and added your quarter and started playing with somebody else because everybody wanted more help. You know, mm -hmm. right? Get it, jump in, jump in. Yeah, jump, that's jump a great, in. fun mm -hmm. team game. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have said it was also the first game to let you add a quarter kick to continue. It's not, but it definitely... It feels I that feel way. Like I yeah. popularized you were paying it. for time at that the time. Wizard <laughs> needs food. <laughs> so, right? So yeah, it was a pay to play. It was your yeah, first yeah. pay to play game. Yeah. Uh, actually, a game that predates that is Fantasy in 1981, which is a pretty cool game. Actually, I looked this one up. I had to watch some footage of it, but uh, that was the first one to allow continue. So it predated it by four years, but uh, definitely cool. I don't uh, know that I've played that one. What, I, is, what's it, what is it like? Buddy, I'm telling you, I may have to look it up on my phone. Or, or you can obviously plug some footage yeah, in. Yeah, I'll put some footage uh, in. I just can't but remember what it looks like. It's, it's cool. I want to say it had like multiple different kinds of levels, which was pretty unique for that day. I forget who it's by. It was like a not just an everyday. Oh, I think it was by SNK maybe. Really? Yeah, like an early SNK game. <laughs> but uh, it looked like a cool game. Uh, it's called Fantasy 1981. Guys, look it up. Play it on emulation or something. Mm -hmm. Tell me how. Yeah. I'm tell you if you like it. Yeah, definitely. Because I don't think you're finding it in an arcade anywhere. <laughs> I certainly don't see it very often. Uh, I haven't. I can't remember seeing that game at one of the local arcades. Yeah. So, cool. Uh, I want to say it might have had some balloons or something like air, hot air balloons or something. <laughs> I don't know. I would look it up. Uh, but uh, definitely, I had to look it up when I was looking up some of this information. Yeah. So, yep. uh, 1986, right after Gauntlet, oh, you'd get Outrun. This would be the first selectable soundtrack. Yeah. Which is yeah. super cool, right? You get to drive a Ferrari and you get to put something on the radio station. Yeah. And that predates your Grand Theft Auto when you had a really cool radio station. <laughs> I, I mean, the heck out of Outrun. Outrun is oh, yeah. so Outrun's cool. Outrun's great. Yeah. Uh, the vibe. If you think about that whole vapor wave, chill wave aesthetic, mm -hmm. right? right? Uh, Outrun is what you think of. Uh, you think of the, the horizon. Right, you're always heading into the horizon, which is super cool. And, and it had those effects that you were talking about that just it did. coming at you. Yeah, yeah, that just <laughs> coming at you. So, uh, yeah, that that, Sega, that scaling, uh, really, really cool. So those were some of mine. Uh, do you all have any others? Let's see. I'm going to check my notes. Well, I actually have, <laughs> I have three more that you won't be able to not mention. Um, how about you? No, I, I think that, uh, you know, I wanted to cover the the fighting games, and I think they all kind of, like, blended into that. I love it, um, yeah. And uh, I, I think anything else of that, we're just going to be talking about Street Fighter 2 anyway. Uh, but er, er. <laughs> I'm just want to talk about Street Fighter 2. That's what I'm hearing when Street Fighter 2 podcast. You no, should have worn I wore the Street Fighter I, shirt I of all things. I didn't I think about it. I didn't think about it. So how about you? Any other ones? I can't think of any. Okay. Um, I mean, there are so many games we could talk about. Like, I totally. mean, I mean, we could throw like, I mean, I'm looking. I've been looking at Gorf over there the whole time. <laughs> Gorf. It's like three games in one. You know, you know it is. Like it's so great. many different things we could talk about. You know, there's just like you said. There's games. There's so many different kinds of um, peripherals as you're playing arcade games, from spinners to paddles to joysticks to joysticks with buttons on them to a combination of both, like Tron. Um, you know, movie tie-in games. I mean, there's so tank many things. Games. Tank games, <laughs> absolutely. Sorry, I got one, one oh, more. Oh, go ahead. We didn't even ahead. touch on the hologram games. Like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is really cool. Like Time Traveler, Time Traveler. Holiseum, uh, some of those games. I, I, I would say Double Dragon would be another one that's super influential as, as far as a beat em up genre may have been. I don't know if that was the first, but boy, know, that was the Final most... Fight seems to be the one that was it, really big, but, you know, and that but, was... Without Double Dragon, I don't think right. you get Final Fight. True, that's yeah. true. So with Double Dragon, you're getting to play two-player, 
uh, you can actually, you can punch each other, which is right. fun. Uh, but most of the time you're just trying to progress through and save somebody at the end of the game. Right. Yeah. And you can pick up weapons. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. Uh, you can pick up some, yeah. like maybe nunchucks or at least a bat and right. definitely a whip. I remember the girl <laughs> yeah, had the a whip. How about every beat em up had a, um, a dominatrix, uh, a dominatrix in it. <laughs> like sadomasochism. The 80s like were a different a whip. time. There was always a girl with a whip in every beat em up. And uh, they were in every game. You know, funny story, you know, in um, uh, Final Fight, you mm -hmm. know how they had uh, the girl with the whip? Yeah, Poison? Yeah, she's a character in Street Fighter. Oh, totally. You know, yeah. so she, it was so popular, moved her over to Street Fighter. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, did Hugo, either of you, Hugo was too. Yep. Hugo did either of you ever play World of Warcraft? I did not. I played it for a little bit, but so, I was a Final Fantasy. So you guy. can have the if you have you can have a warlock and it's your character, and you can spawn like these little uh, companion creatures. And mm -hmm. one of the ones that a warlock can do is a succubus. So it's like girl with a whip. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. and I always liked it when people were fighting me. Most of the time, with the succubus, they were like, "Whip, whip me again! Yeah, do it again! <laughs> again. <laughs> I've got a hundred health potions. Whip me!" I like that video you sent me earlier. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, that we'll is talk not about that podcast. Yeah. <laughs> That's not podcast appropriate. Uh, anyway, uh, the uh, the one one other one I wanted to mention uh, was uh, NBA Jam. Uh, this is a first, maybe maybe not the first licensed game. Obviously, Arch Rivals uh, predates it, but this set off a four player. Um, sports game genre in its own uh, because you basically had arch rivals before that was kind of a punch and fight and right. a two-on-two -two basketball. But NBA Jam had a license. Uh, you had licensed NBA players that led to the, your NFL blitzes and your NHL um, uh, hit the ice or what's the other one? Open ice. Uh, so you had these uh, you know, fantastic moves and it was an arcade style. Uh, and that game made oh my gosh uh it out it came out around the same time jurassic park came out and made i think four billion dollars in quarters in oh, wow. quarters I mean, can you imagine four billion dollars in quarters you stacked know, up and i don't know if any other game did this but that was the first game that i remember that you could put your initials and save your progress and come mm. back and play later oh. you could do that you could do that in gauntlet legacy i know that yeah we, we never that. talked about that that's 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 that's, that's a really game cool game. thing yeah. uh you know and the modern version of that i think is the keypad code mm -hmm. you see on like yep. raw thrill games mm -hmm. uh raw thrills games i should say uh, and then other than that if you're getting into other influential stuff you start getting into really cool peripherals like you know dance dance revolution uh, you're talking about a dancing game that set off, you know, Step Maniacs and uh, Pump It Up, all that other mm -hmm. kind of dancing game. They, they still have competitions for DDR. Oh, totally. You know, they, you know, I could throw this out there. Game Changer is probably whatever game first was on JAMA because now everything's interchangeable. Mm. That, what was what, the what, first what, what JAMA, was the JAMA game? game? Yeah, we got to figure out what that is because mm. think about it. Like if anything's JAMA, just unplug it, plug in the new one. So if you're listening to this and you don't understand JAMA, this is a Japanese arcade machine what was the last two MA stand for? I used yeah. to know this. This was a it's a standardized connection, a 56 pin connector. So this made it easier for operators to say back in the day, if you converted a game, this would make it easier for an operator to uh, pull a board out and stick another board in because the connection would be the same. So it provides power, video, everything. Yeah, it yep. provides power, video, sound, the ability to coin the game up, um, all your Japan controls. Japan Amusement Machine and Marketing Association. Marketing <laughs> Association. God, I would have <laughs> never got that in 100 <laughs> years. I'm surprised I knew the first three letters. Anyway, yeah. that's JAMA. And it actually says that a lot of time printed on the board. And it's a, like I said, it's a 56 pin connector and you can just plug right in. And some of the stuff that's standard on JAMA is the power and the coin and the video, the RGB and sync and Speakers, ground, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Just swap so. in a couple of buttons, let you completely t play a different game in that cabinet. Right. You know? And then what they would send these kits out with a JAMA board and a new control panel overlay and a new marquee and maybe some side art or maybe just maybe a maybe you know, a bezel <laughs> maybe yeah, maybe uh so you can convert games a lot easier with jamma uh and then everything in the arcade if it's jamma it's much easier to move around you know move boards around or replacement boards it's just it's also easier, easier to troubleshoot <laughs> easier to troubleshoot because yep. you kind of know the path of where everything's going so anyway so i don't know what the first jamma game is and this should be a full content Yep. Uh, yep. comment section because uh, <laughs> they would just be everywhere as far as that oh. goes. So, uh, Anything else to say? I know you're going to beat us up. We've left off some game that oh. changed your world and uh, we don't know what that is. <laughs> so, Or we've just forgotten. 
Uh, but put door. it in the comments. Let us know because we'd love to know what game changed your life. What did what made you want to go to the arcade? You know, yeah. what do you like? What's yeah. your passion? All right. You know? Do you have any game? If you if you say I'll go back to it. I almost said it earlier, but influential. It, what's a game they should play? A big influential game that they should absolutely play this week. Man, you know what? I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and just say, you know, fi fighting game. Just pick a <laughs> <street> <laughs> fighting game. <laughs> pick a Street Fighter. Survival two. Arts. And you can what? play. Uh, yeah, and I'm not. I'm tattoo I mean, assassins. <laughs> uh, any fighting game. No, what I would say is really try to find a couple of different Street Fighter games. Street Fighter Two. Street and Fighter Two. Just play a couple of them and just see how everything started changing at that Learn time. Learn to do a move. Yeah. Throw do, a Hadouken. Do a move, you know, do a dragon punch, uh, yeah. you know, especially if you're playing against Akuma. It's always dragon punch Akuma. <laughs> dragon punch Akuma. <laughs> How about you, Mike? What should they play? What I, influential game should they play? I am going to do a pinball this week. What? Yeah, yeah. A pinball machine? Totally, play a pinball machine. Forget totally, video games. Yeah, forget video games. You should totally go and play Stranger Things. Stranger Things pinball. If you I'll find tell it, you why. Okay. Because I spent uh, a couple days ago, I spent a couple hours, and I put the UV kit on the Time Rift Stranger Things. Yeah. Dude, that is the most amazing thing It's really cool. Ever. Yeah. My wife and I pl probably played that game for like three hours. It's ago. a great game. And uh, I mean, upside down world where everything mm -hmm. just changes like two, mm -hmm. two pinball machines in one. It's amazing. Stern created a game uh, based on the Netflix TV series Stranger Things, and it's really, really fun. It awesome. has some really fun, innovative things. Yep. Uh, if you have a... Uh, premium or higher, premium or, or LE, the, it has a projector in it. So it's got almost a little drive-in movie on mm -hmm. the screen, which is really cool. Uh, if you activate uh, a mode by knocking down the drop targets in the middle, the, driving, the little movie screen folds down and creates a ramp and it has a Demogorgon behind it. Now you can you fight the Demogorgon. You can fight the Demogorgon, you can which is fight it with a pinball. Put a pinball right down its throat. You put a pinball down its throat and end his life immediately if you got a good shot on it. So. And I I have figured out, and actually I think my wife figured this out first. But if you pull the uh, plunger just to the right spot, you can actually graze all four of those drop targets. Oh yeah, in one go. Wow, nice. that's pretty good. That's pretty I good. like that. I like that a lot. Uh, if I said uh, to play a game this week, I would probably pick. Tapper, if you've never played Tapper. And um, <laughs> I have that on my super innovative arcade cabinet list because it actually has tap handles. You you basically play a bartender. This is a early Bally Midway game. You, you play a bartender and there's patrons coming to the bar and you simply just move your bartender and pull a tap handle <laughs> like you're pouring <laughs> beers. And this was in arcades for kids. So well, they you, had a root beer version. They did, they did have a root beer version, <laughs> but you might run across the Budweiser version <laughs> And actually, branded Budweiser and send uh, beer down to the patrons, which is uh, super cool. So a really fun game. Uh, so find a place to play Tapper. Uh, one of my favorite things for that game is crazy. I don't, the people are getting either love or hate it, but it's the Simpsons mod for it. Yes, that's really cool. <laughs> I actually like it. Yeah, they got a ROM set where all the characters are, you're basically in Moe's Tavern then, and uh, all the characters are like Barney and Homer from the Simpsons, and you're sending Serving beers down the bar. <laughs> they should make a Family Guy one since they always go to a bar and Family oh, Guy yeah, too. That would totally, be really cool. Totally. Uh, that would be our custom arcade podcast. That someone, <laughs> someone actually in the comments wanted to talk, us talk about custom arcades. And we're totally going to do that. And we're totally going to do that. And I'm going to touch on one because we're going to do something different here at the end. And this is an arcade spotlight is what I'm going to call it. And uh, we're going to fill in with a few little pictures here for an arcade. And the arcade we're going to spotlight today is Geeks Mania arcade and this is in madison wisconsin it's a 15 dollar all day wristband uh, they don't serve beer there uh, but they have over 100 arcade machines there lots of classics lots of linked drivers that are great they have two deluxe environmental star wars battle pods two of them wow so we get inside projector behind you full surround like you're an omni theater Very awesome uh they have two of those uh they have at least 15 classic bally and new stern pinballs i believe they may have the stranger things yeah. pin do we have a square footage for them? uh i don't have a square footage that's a great question i'll get that next time yeah. they have pool tables they have ski ball they have oh, they air hockey yeah. they have a so they've done a couple of custom arcades and one I'm impressed with. One I'm freaking blown away by. So the one I'm impressed with is they have a DDR machine and it is see-through. So they have like a plexi on it and you can actually see the machines, like see the boards in there. They did some modifications to it, but they wanted you to see it was still running on original hardware. That is awesome. So that a whole so see-through cool. 
DDR. That's cool, but not as cool as the next one. They have a Marvel themed room with Marvel arcade oh. machines. So your Capcom. Oh, uh, we forgot I'm, to I'm there. Marvel's Capcom. Uh, oh my god. Uh, all this, but that's not the I'll most unique thing. <laughs> the most unique thing is they had a board set for six player X Men, but they didn't have the cabinet. So they got the board set. They put a 160 inch screen. <laughs> Two projectors, because you know that's a dual monitor game. Wow. Project on the wall. And you know the if you've seen Pac-Man Battle Royale and its pedestal style mm -hmm. with the circle pedestals, mm -hmm. six of those. So the whole room, one half of the room, is six player X-Men. Oh my God. And that's it, amazing. You're, you're, so you want to talk about custom arcades, folks? Geeks Mania Arcade, Madison, Wisconsin, 15 bucks. Go in there and play this giant, the biggest, as far as I'm concerned, the biggest in the world, <laughs> uh, the biggest six player X Men. That's a big uh, cabinet. That's already. amazing. So, dual monitor, uh, they, dual they did the dual, dual projectors to project on a 160 inch screen. I, I was blown away when I saw this. So, I was like, okay, well, we're talking about that on the podcast. So, go play this game. Uh, I watched uh, the owner interview with uh, Indie Wave Arcade. And uh, it was a really fun interview watching how he had a lot of enthusiasm for the, his arcade. So pretty cool. Yeah. 160 inch screen. Wow. <laughs> Six player X. Wow. I'm in. They even put Dazzler in there. She's <laughs> really in, even though she went in the cartoon. She's right there, right? You get to play all six characters. So really cool pedestals, too, with custom artwork on them. They're round like those Pac Man pedestals. Okay. So you think they repurpose some of those? Or? I don't think so. This looks like a total custom, custom build. build. Total, custom total custom build. build. So, and it's. So well done. So uh, anyway, Arcade Spotlight. Anything awesome. else you want to close this thing up, Mike? You got anything? That's, I think we're there. You got anything? I'm good. All right. Remember to like and subscribe and listen to our previous podcast and listen, listen to our next podcast. So our next podcast, what are we talking about in there? Um, it's going to be home ports. We're going to see some of these arcades come home. We touched on it a little bit here. Yep. We got a lot of things to say about that if you're interested. Hey. Watch us some more. Watch a, watch a little bit more. And then uh, until next time, he's Mike Murray. He's Roman Saldivar. And I'm Mike Woods. Uh, come back and watch the next podcast. We'll see you on the next one. See you soon. See you soon.